Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And uh, we've been kind of dealing with the individuals that are mentioned there. And he says, what shall I more say for the time would fail to tell of? And tonight we want to talk about Samuel, all right, to tell of Samuel. So that's who we're going to be dealing with tonight. Now, keep in mind, uh, by the way, let me say this while it's on my mind. Next Wednesday, I'm going to be out of town. Uh, So uh, Brother Cody will be speaking next Wednesday. All right, so he'll be bringing the lesson. And so be sure and be here, support him, encourage him in that. But uh, he'll, be, he'll be doing the lesson for you. All right, and he'll be having someone else do the uh, lesson for the teens. So just keep that in mind. All right, but, um, but tonight we're dealing with Samuel. If we're going to deal with Samuel, I really think you have to start with his mom. Because I really think she makes a really big impact on Samuel and the decisions that she had made uh, in regard to her relationship with the Lord uh, is pretty much what put Samuel in a position where he learned the things that he needed to learn and where he was committed to the things that he was committed to. And his mother is Hannah, and Hannah, her story begins in 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'm not going to turn there. I'm basically just going to tell you that story, all right, and then we're going to jump into dealing with Samuel. But it begins with she is the, the husband, her husband. She is barren. We see that. It, that story is a lot, you know, in Scripture where the wife doesn't have a child and, and she goes to the Lord and begs of the Lord to give her a child and, and uh, he makes the provisions for her to have children. And in the case of Hannah, uh, the child that she had, that she had went to the Lord and, and begged of that, and then she made a promise to God that if he would give her that child, that um, she would surrender him to the Lord and surrender him to the work of the Lord. Well, long story short, God gives her that child and she then, after the child is weaned, after he's old enough that, you know, he can, you know, just eat normal food and that kind of thing, they take the child, she takes the child and basically to the temple and Eli uh, raises him, teaches him and trains him up. And so he grew up in the home and, uh, and under the leadership, basically, of the leaders of the land, okay, of the priests of the land. And so he had a good understanding of what was taking place and what was going on. So he had a very prominent life in that regard. But also note that Samuel, uh, beca- uh, and by the way, concerning Hannah, once she did that, um, God gave her additional children. So don't get the idea that God gave her a child and then just took him away from her. I mean, essentially, that child, she had made a promise, and he, he used Samuel greatly, just like she wanted him to do. And so what we find is Samuel grows up. He turns out to be basically the very last of the judges. When you read the, uh, the book of Judges, what you find is Samuel's the last one that's mentioned there. He's the one that basically winds up anointing the kings. But we find that Samuel, in chapter 7 and verse 15 of 1 Samuel, all of these quotes will be from 1 Samuel unless I tell you different, okay? But in 7.15, and Samuel judged to Israel all the days of his life. All right, so he was a judge, and he judged all the days of his life. God used Samuel to anoint the first two kings of Israel, one being Saul, the other being David. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, he is apparently kind of a first along the list of the prophets of Israel. That's not to say there was no prophecies before this. We all know there were. In fact, we have prophecies all the way back to Adam and Eve. So, so we understand and know there were prophecies prior to, but just to say here is an individual that God has chosen to use specifically as a prophet Uh, we find Samuel being that and kind of the first of those that God seems to single out for just such a thing as that. Um, He tells us in Acts chapter 3 and verse 24, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. So in Acts, when he's talking of those things, he makes it pretty clear that all the prophets talked about those things beginning with Samuel, giving us the indication that Samuel would be the first of what God would deem a true prophet. All right. We also find what really puts him on the list of Hebrews chapter 11 is that he was so incredibly faithful to do everything that God called him to do. Now, I'm gonna be honest, Samuel is one of those that I can't just say I'm gonna single out one particular event 
in the life of Samuel and say this is probably what put him on the list. In the case of Samuel, I think it was more than just some single event that puts him on this list. I think in the case of Samuel, what we find is it's the way he conducted his life as a whole. In the case of Samuel, he was obedient to God from the very beginning. God used him early in his age or early in his life when he was very young, and he continued to use him all the way through his life. In fact, he was of the tribe of Levi. He was a Levite. So he was not only a judge but he was, and a prophet, but he was also a priest. In fact, while he was still very young, we're told in, in 1 Samuel 2.18, but Samuel ministered before the Lord being a child, and he says, girded with a linen ephod, which tells us that even as what the Bible would deem a child, now we've talked about that before. In the Bible, when we talk about a child, we're talking about anyone under the age of 20. All right. So when we're talking about him being a child, you and I might sit and think, well, you must have been eight or nine years old. No, he could have been anything under 20, and that was deemed a child. So he could have been 18, 19 years old, whatever the case may be. But in any case, what we find is from a very young age, we're told that he ministered before the Lord, and he says, girded with a linen ephod, which was a part of the, uh, uh, the dress of the priest. All right, and so what we find is in his case, he was already, even as a child, was already understanding and knowing how to do uh, the role or to fulfill the role of a priest. But then again, that's why he was raised by Eli. That's why he was placed in the temple to be raised, and that's, he's learning these things, even from a very young age, what he was to do, how he was to do it. Um, I, I heard someone tell me one time, and I thought this was the most nonsense thing I'd ever heard in my entire life. And they told me this. They said, you should never force your children to learn the things of God. They, if they don't make those decisions on their own, you know, and if you don't give them the opportunity to, if you only force them to do that, they'll rebel. I'm telling you, that's the most idiotic thing I ever heard in my entire life. We have a responsibility to teach them the things of God. If we don't teach them the things of God, they're gonna learn the things of the world, simple as that. And they're gonna learn the things of the world regardless because they're gonna be living here. I want them to have some ammunition. I want them to know something. And that nonsense, uh, I'm gonna use a, a, a crazy word here, but the nonsense idiotic concept that listen, if we do that, we might drive them away from the church, they'll hate the church, is so stupid. All right? They need to understand and know that, listen, these things are important. You know, there's nothing else in life that we take that attitude with. It's so funny. You know, we never say, well, you know, um, you know, this whole concept of the children, you know, our children, whether it's going to school, whether it's learning to read, whether it's learning arithmetic, you know, you make them sit down and learn those things. And there's no one that says, well, if you do that, they're going to hate it. So? They need to learn it. They need to know it. We would say that about anything and everything that's important in life. Why is it that when it comes to the things of God, all of a sudden we decide to take a different attitude? So we need to understand that, listen, these things are important. She made a commitment. Hannah made a commitment to God. I'm going to raise Samuel, have Samuel raised in a way that what he is going to know are the things of God. So from a very early age, he is already doing the things that God intends for him to do when he grows up. All right? But here's what we're going to do. Because there's so many things in Samuel's life, I'm just going to pick out a, a few that you might be familiar with, you might not be, um, that I think picture the kind of character that he had and the kind of person that he was and it, it gives us the reasons why he's included on this list we find uh, the very opening of first samuel chapter 3 a blanket statement all right and then after he makes this blanket statement he goes back and explains it by the way just so you know when you're studying scripture you get this a lot um, so when you study you don't think that things are backwards understand this is the way God does this. All the way back in Genesis, when he reveals to you the creation, he tells you in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, right? But then he proceeds to tell you how he did it, all right? He just gives you a blanket statement, God created all this. And then he says, 
Here's what he did. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, he rested. And then after he's done with that, he goes back again, yet again, and begins to detail some of the things that took place even more so in how he began to use them. He does that all the way through scripture. We see this really quite often. This is an example of what he does even here. In 1 Samuel chapter three, verse one, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision, okay? So he says the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And then in verse two, he kind of goes back and begins to kind of tell you some of the ways that he ministered and how these things came about. And I'm going to read that for you in a second. But I want you to see something here that I think should stand out for you. It has really nothing to do with the lesson, but it's just an important fact that you might want to know. Because a lot of times people will tell you that, you know, that there is always, there's always, God always gives visions and God always gives prophecies. And you need to understand that when we read about prophecies and visions and all of that in the scripture, there's only like appointed times where those things took place. It wasn't something that just regularly occurred, all right? We happen to live in a day and time today where he tells us, you know, that we're not in that day. In the early church, they, there were some things that took place in that regard. Once the Bible was complete, we have that in our hand. It's not necessary for us to have those things. We happen to live in a day where those things aren't even present, all right? Now, in the days of Samuel, they were not present either, but because God was about to do something different. And keep in mind, what he's going to do different is he's going to move from the judges ruling Israel to them having a king. Something is different. Something is changing, and God always identifies that change in such a way for the Jews to understand and know this is me that's doing it. All right. When the church came about, we see a lot of those kind of miracles. You see it in Jesus Christ. But it was to let them know that, hey, listen, the Messiah that's been prophesied for the last thousands of years has come and it's in the person of Jesus Christ. And just to prove to you that he's the son of God needs to let you know and see some of these miracles so that you understand and know, listen, we know he's from God. All right. So all of these things are to identify that. So in the case of Samuel, it was to identify what was about to take place because some changes were going to happen. So he tells you in that passage um, that um, it was a day when, let's see, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So what he's saying is, is what they had written what they had that they could read, what they had on whatever kind of material they would have in order to study or to know, because when they wrote down God's word, I mean, they were really precise about it. The scribes were really particular about it. And so it wasn't like they do today. We don't, we don't have like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Bibles printed and just available in any store you walk into. They didn't have that. To have a Bible was something really, to have something with God's word on it was something really precious and at this time you really didn't have you know at the time of Samuel you only really had the law all right and so you had the law a few writings but basically all you had was the law and so it was a really precious thing to have that and to be able to read that or to hear it preached or taught or whatever the case may be and he says and the word of the Lord was precious because he said there was no open vision it wasn't a day and time where God was working in such a fashion where he had people on every street corner being able to you know have an understanding or a prophecy of what was going on you know in the early church every church had prophets in the church but that's not the case once you get the word in your hand. In the case of Samuel, it was a case where there were no open visions. It wasn't like everybody was, you know, he didn't have prophets assigned. Samuel was that guy. And so he was, something different was going on, something was going to change, and he was using Samuel as that guy uh, to bring this about. And so it was a time where it was very precious. And then when you get into verse 2, I'm going to read quite a bit here, okay? Uh, in verse 2, he says, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, and the ark was uh, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. All right, keep in mind, Samuel's apparently very young here. And this is uh, actually the child minister unto the Lord before Eli. This is what brought this about. This is what brought these things to pass to where God would give him a vision or give him the insight. Verse four, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here am I. Um, and he ran unto Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I, I called not. 
lie down again. He said, I didn't, I didn't yell for you. Wasn't me. Go back to bed. All right. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son. Lie down again. I did not call you. I don't know what I don't know what's going on, but go back to bed. All right. And uh, and so then we find uh, where am I at? Verse seven. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. All right, he's still a young guy. He's not. This is not something that he's been privy to. This is not something he's ever experienced before. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, "Here am I, for thou didst call me." And Eli perceived that it was the Lord that had called the child. He's like, Eli's like, "Oh, wait a minute, something's going on." God's got a hand on this young boy. God's going to do something great with this young man. I perceive that, that this is God calling him. Go lie down and listen. This is what's going to happen. Therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down to his place, and the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Here is kind of the beginning of Samuel's ministry. This is kind of the beginning, you know, where he says, listen, Lord, tell me what you want. Tell me what to do. I hear you. When you see that, heareth, for thy servant heareth. Now, I know Eli told him to say that, but it's the idea that he wasn't just to say it because Eli said for him to. <clears throat> Eli was giving him instructions to basically follow the word of the Lord. Listen, you need to hear what he has to say and you need to be obedient to that. And so from this moment on, Samuel not only just hears the voice of the Lord as he does here, but he hears it in such a way that he abides by it, he does it. And so what we find is from this very young age, he was surrendered to the will of God and we find him obedient to God's will even as this young man, we know that because after all that takes place, we can go back to our initial verse in verse one, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. We know that that's what he does. So, you know, when we see all of this taking place, what we know about his life is that, listen, God called me, and I'm going to minister to him because he called me, and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to follow his will. So if that was the only example, that would be a fine example of someone that should be included in the list here in Hebrews chapter 11 because he clearly was obedient to the will of God even from a very, very young age, all right? Um, and again, it, it's difficult to find just a single example of faith on his part. So we're going to highlight a few more just to kind of give you a picture. As far as Samuel being a prophet of God and, and all of Israel recognizing it to be so, I, I got to tell you, you got to think about this. It's one thing to be a prophet of God. But how do you convince millions upon millions of people I'm a prophet of God. You know, it's tough enough if I were a prophet to convince this many people. It'd be tough to convince you. Can you imagine to go before the entire nation and say, hey, listen, just so you know, I'm a prophet of God. It just sounds so arrogant, doesn't it? And it's one of those things that if you were to stand up and say, God said this, why would they believe you? Who is it there? I mean, keep in mind the nation of Israel. This is not a time where the Holy Spirit fills the hearts and lives of individuals. Um, it's not a time where the word of the Lord is prominent. He said he wasn't revealing himself in visions and such. And so you have Samuel who says, hey, listen, God's dealing with my heart and life. God spoke to me during a time where he's not speaking. God spoke to me, and I want you to know that God said for us to be this or God said for us to do that. God said for you to put away those idols. God said for you to get your life right with him. God said for us to anoint a king. God said, why listen to him? And I've often wondered how all of that kind of comes about. But here's Samuel who is now considered a prophet of God. And you see this, he says in verse uh, chapter three and verse 19, it says that Samuel grew and says, the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Stop there for a second. He's saying whatever he had to say, God made sure that it was understood that these were 
right words. These were words of God. He didn't let them just fall to the ground. That means he didn't let them fall on deaf ears is what he's saying. He made sure that what he spoke, that he made sure that people heard them and God gave them the ability to hear them, understand them, know them, all right? You ever wondered this as well? Um, throughout all of Israel, these people lived all through Israel. He is perhaps a judge of all Israel. We're told that, uh, which is not like all the judges, but Samuel seems to be a judge of all of Israel. And in addition to that, what we find in Samuel is if he speaks the words here today, I mean, who, who speaks those words, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles north, you know, um, to all the people that live all over the place. So you got to keep in mind that when he speaks, it's not like he can just speak. He's got, he's got all these people he needs to speak to. Um, helps you to understand scripture in that respect, by the way, because sometimes in the New Testament, you have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and sometimes it's difficult to say, is this, you know, God speaking, this, or Jesus is preaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and then you jump over into, uh, say, the book of Luke, and you say, oh, there he is speaking the Sermon on the Mount again. No, he's not. In fact, if you read it, you find he's speaking it in the valley. And you say, but it's the same sermon. It's got to be the same one. Seriously? Everywhere he goes, he's probably preaching that and teaching that. Who knows how many times Jesus taught that? How many times must he have taught it? I can just tell you now, I've got sermons that I've preached, whether it be in a revival meeting, whether it be here at this church, whether it be in another church for one reason or another, a youth conference or a, you know, at the jail or wherever it is I might be at a nursing home. I've got some sermons I've preached as many as probably 30, 40 times. Because the people here, Kenny's going, yeah, I know, I've heard them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, here's the deal. For you, those of you that mark your Bibles, you know better than anybody else, okay? I, I get it, I get it. But here's the deal. We understand and know that, listen, Jesus did the same thing. What he preached here, he may go down the road and preach again because those people didn't hear it. So my point being is this, that in the case of Samuel, he's got to get this message, whatever it is that God gives him, he's got to get this message out to all of Israel somehow or another. Now, whether or not he gives a message to these people and then they scatter and tell other people, I, I don't know how it all goes about, but all the nation needed here. So when Jesus, uh, when God says that his, his words didn't fall to the ground, what he's saying is, is he, the words that he spoke was taken out to where there was no vanity in it. It was utilized and in every way imaginable, it was told to all the people, all right? So that it was spread about. And so people heard that. Well, how do you know that? Um, he says in verse 20, and all Israel, listen to this, and all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. But what he had to say, how he proclaimed it, how God gave him that ability, how God gave him that power, how he perhaps moved in the lives of all of Israel, how it seemed like people grabbed these words and gravitated to them and, and knew that they were something special, but however it was, everybody knew, dude, Samuel's a prophet. <laughs> He's a prophet, all right? So everybody knew and understood that Samuel was a prophet. And I think it has to do with the fact that Samuel's life was a life that illustrated, I am a man of God and I'm doing what God has called me to do. You know, I think that that is so important when people see in our life that we are what we say we are, and it makes a difference. You know, I've had people uh, in, in my neighborhood that when we go and talk to them, we talk to our neighbors all the time and that kind of stuff, and, and they'll say, yeah, I know Christ, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, but on Sunday mornings, you know, that's when they mow their grass, and that's when they, and it's like, okay, I get it. There's something missing. I'm not saying they're not saved. I can't answer that question for them. But I will say that, you know what? There's something missing. There's something missing. And I, I want people to look at me and say, you know, that dude every Sunday morning gets in his car. He's all dressed up. He's going to church. I'll just tell you now. I know where he's going, you know. And I love it when neighbors say, hey, can, you know, you want to you wanna meet and do this or do that? And I say, well, yeah, I'd love to, but it's at a church time. I can't. Um, I had a funny thing happen today. He thought it was hilarious, but the, um, we have to get our water meter moved. They want to move it closer to the church. No big deal. Just the water company, or Fairfield Utilities actually, wants to move it closer. And so he calls me up today, and we're talking about it. He says, is there a good day? Because obviously they'll have the water off. 
for whatever length of time they got to do that. And uh, I said, well, yeah, we, I'm sure we can work out a day. He says, well, you know, he says, how about uh, we, we show up there Sunday morning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, of course, I laughed, you know. He meant it as a joke. I knew he meant it as a joke. But uh, we laughed. He says, I'm so glad you laughed at that. He says, you know, sometimes when I think about it, he says, I've been wanting to say that ever since I knew I was going to talk to you. <laughs> so, but it's good that people know, isn't it? I mean, people need to know that, hey, listen, we love the Lord, and because we love the Lord, this is where we're going to be. You know, I've had family that say, hey, we're going to visit. We're going to be there. No, don't. If you're going to come on Sunday, you're going to go to church with us, or you're going to sit there until I get home, one of the two. I'm not missing my church for you, you know? I want to serve the Lord, and don't make plans for me when my plans are to be doing what God's called me to do. Don't, let's not do that. It's not the way this works, all right? So, you know, and that's not to say we can't vacation. It's not to say we can't be away. You know my point. I'm saying that people need to see that this is our routine. This is what we do. This is, this is our life. And if, if that's not our life and if people can't see that in us, then what we say is going to make no difference to them. What Samuel had to say made a difference because they saw in his life that he was a prophet, he knew it. He's a prophet, all right? So Samuel made a difference in the lives around him, all right? At a time when Israel had turned from God, they, had worshiped, they were worshiping false gods. Uh, they were suffering at the hands of the Philistines because of that. And uh, Samuel challenged Israel to put away these gods. <laughs> Another common thread throughout Israel, isn't it? It just seems like they kept getting caught up in the gods of that land. And, uh, and so again, Get rid of the gods, serve only the true God, and he'll give you victory over the Philistines. Now, that was his message, and that was what Samuel was preaching to him. Uh, 1 Samuel 7, 3 says this, And Samuel spoke unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Um, now, here's the deal. Once God delivered them, Samuel made certain that it was God, and they knew that it was God who had delivered them, all right? And so what happens here is as a result of all of this, um, he sets a stone up. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the stone of Ebenezer, all right? And so they set up the stone of Ebenezer, and that basically what that word means is the Lord helped us. And it was to remind them as a nation that, listen, right here at this point in time, at this place, God helped us, all right? And so that's what they did. And so he wanted to make sure that they knew that. And so verse 12, then Samuel took a stone set between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, Ebenezer, however you want to say it. It depends on whether or not you're from the south or the north. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So that's what the stone meant, and that's what he wanted to establish. So the land, which had been captured by the Philistines, was restored unto Israel as a result of Samuel's faith. Now, I want you to stop and think about his faith for a moment. Well, God said, be sure and turn this nation around. Let them know that what they're doing is not in my will, and the reason that they're under the control of the Philistines is because they're worshiping false gods. If they'll forsake those gods, put them out of the way, get, repent, come back to the place where they're serving the one true and living God, then I'll give them their land back that the Philistines have taken, and I'll give them back their freedom. But that's what they got to do. Now, that may sound like, you know, okay, well, Samuel just did what God told him to do, but you have to understand the impact of that. I mean, that nation, how many times through Scripture are we told where they killed the prophets because they didn't want to hear that message? You know, how many times are we told that, listen, you know, when we come up against them and they didn't want to hear the message, they didn't want to see this, do this, that basically the easy thing is to kill them. What do you think they did to Jesus? I mean, they didn't like his message, so let's just put him to death. Let's, let's find a way to kill him. And so he's got millions of people in this nation that are worshiping false gods, and they're saying, don't tell me what to do. Imagine this. Imagine standing up in the United States of America and, and actually having an opportunity to have the audience of the entire nation and tell the entire nation, listen, God is not going to bless us unless you put away this LGBTQ stuff, unless you put away the adultery 
that people are living in. Unless you put away the sin that so easily besets us. Unless you put away all of these false gods and all this false religion that's going on, God cannot and will not bless us. Now, let me tell you, how much courage does it take to get in front of an entire nation and say that, a nation like ours today, that are kill you in a moment? And you say, well, the United States... I mean, people, are, you have freedom, you have liberty. No, you don't. No, you don't. You stand up and proclaim that message, and you are every name that they can call you, and it's, a, it's, it's definitely a jail sentence, possibly a death sentence. So understand that that's what he did. He stood up in front of a nation that was worshiping these false gods and said, that's wrong. For those of you that were here to hear Jacques' testimony, uh, you know, when you look at the picture that he was talking about there in Haiti and with the black magic and all that, that's, that's what they were doing. That's false worship. That's what they were doing. So these are evil people consumed with Satan, consumed with all that Satan would have them to do. And these people, he's standing up in front of them and going, you better put that away. God can't bless you otherwise. These are the people he's standing up and opposing. Imagine Take the description that Jacques gave you. Imagine going to that same party and going in there and preaching Jesus Christ to them. You get your Bible out and your Bible thumping, your hellfire and brimstone on them, you know, and you're letting them know that, listen, God is not pleased with this. God is going to defeat Satan and you need to understand that this is the truth and you guys are going to die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. His blood can wash you and cleanse you. Imagine what would have happened. This is what Samuel did. And these are the same people that he's standing and proclaiming this message to. When we look at these things, sometimes we look at it from this Americanized eye. And we need to look at it from the eyes that they were experiencing these things. All right? People that would put you to death in a moment. People that, uh, you know, if they didn't like what you had to say, you were gone. Samuel was willing to stand up to an entire nation, but they recognized him. God miraculously caused them to recognize him to be a prophet of God and that what he had to say was truth, and they listened to him, and they listened to him. And so once they did and they put those things away, God gave them back their land. So the Philistines were subdued, we see in verse 13 of chapter 7, and they came no more into the coast of Israel, and the hand, listen to this, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Because of Samuel, God prevented the Philistines from being able to overcome them. So in the days of Samuel, the Philistines could not overcome the Israelites. Now they came against them, we know that, but they couldn't overcome them. And he had set up this stone of Ebenezer, Ebenezer, this stone to let everybody remember what God had done on this day because they surrendered to the Lord. Don't want you to forget this because it's so important, so important. And so we're then told, he says, in the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath. And the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. All right, a whole lot more on Samuel I want to talk about, but I'm, I guess I'm done. I'm out of time. All right, so next time I speak, uh, a couple of weeks, we'll finish up Samuel. And it's just a little bit more, but it does tie into the next, next one that we're going to deal with, just all the prophets as a whole. And so, uh, so we'll stop there. All right, and uh, Judy, do I see you with a pen in your hand? I just need to mark that so I know where I stopped. All right, guys, I appreciate you. Okay, here, I've got, oh, you got, okay. Thank you. It worked. All right. Guys, thanks for coming out tonight. Don't forget, any able-bodied guys or even girls, if you're able-bodied, all right, we're going to unload 3,000 pounds of rock right out that door. All right. You thought I was kidding when I said 3,000 pounds, didn't you? That's the rock, and then also the mortar, all right? So hopefully it won't just go through the floor. No. 
Seems like it's awful heavy for just that little bit of spot. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, all right. Uh, let's go ahead and bow and we'll be dismissed. Dear Father, Lord, thank you for the lesson tonight. And I pray, Lord, that um, you'll just do great things with it. Lord, I pray that you'll cause us to be more of what we need to be and that you'll cause us to want and desire to serve you all the more. Lord, you're a great God and we love you for it. We ask, Lord, that um, you'll just give us that strength, that courage, that boldness to do what you've called us to do. We thank you. Go with us now into our homes. Give us a good night's rest, Lord. May we be about your business tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.